Um, so what I'd like to do at this time is uh, please invite Sue Forrester to the stage. She's with the Energy Institute of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce to talk about America's energy future, challenges, and opportunities. Uh, please join me in welcoming Sue. Thank you. Appreciate it. Good morning, everybody. How are you today? All right, I'm going to take this down. Uh, okay. Technology is not my strength, so bear with me. Let's make sure we get it moving forward. Okay, great. So um, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm Sue Forster from the U.S. Chambers uh, Institute for 21st Century Energy. Yes, that means I'm from Washington. Please don't throw anything at me. We're here just to talk to you, kind of give you a perspective of what's going on in D.C. It's a little bit daunting to be up here as the first speaker, but uh, the Energy Institute was created um, eight years ago by energy users and producers to kind of figure out um, energy policy moving forward. Congress, as you know, likes to think everything happens on their timetable at two years and six years, which energy policy is built out much longer than that. So we, um, we advocate for affordable, reliable energy policy that's kind of growing with the country and is moving forward on a more 10, 20, 30 type year basis. So uh, I'm going to talk to you pretty much about the challenges facing industry today. We're going to talk a little bit about demand, then the resources. We have them. You all know that because you see them in your backyard, in your neighborhoods, and in your counties. Uh, kind of the policies of scarcity that seem to kind of still be ruling Washington, D.C., and then kind of the current state of play in D.C., so what people are seeing, kind of what's happening right now. So onward we go. So demand. As you're looking at this, we got a bunch of big numbers here. The world needs energy shortly. I mean, just that's what it is. Most of the demand, as you'll see, is in um, the developing world. So you're talking about a billion and a half of people who don't have modern energy. That means there are about, and this is my favorite factoid, about 600 million people that don't have access to regular refrigeration and are still using fire and dung for heating and cooking purposes. So as you can imagine, their leaders are motivated by a whole different set of issues in the developing nations than ours here in the U.S. Uh, it's important to note on the last slide right down, or the last bullet on the bottom, that 90% of um, the world, are, of the reserves are owned, um, nationally owned oil companies, which means our companies here in the United States, uh, we're kind of competing for the other 10% that's out there, so understanding kind of how demand works. Um, all right, next slide. Looking to the right, kind of reinforcing my uh, point to you, China is expected to double their demand even as their economy slows, as well as India, so kind of over there on the right-hand side of the slide. Uh, now, these are folks that are developing energy with different standards than the U.S. Rob Gardner from ExxonMobil, who's your luncheon keynote speaker, is going to get much more in-depth, but again, I'm using the demand needs kind of as a, as a context for what we see for growth and production. In the U.S., you'll see uh, demand again goes up in 2040. Uh, the big point here, though, is you know if you look, if you add up the numbers, uh, natural gas, fossil fuels, well, fossil fuels in general make up about 82 percent, but by 2040, they are still making 79 percent, make up 79 percent of what we're using. So, not a lot of changing. Even as we're getting renewables to build out and get onto the grid, the scale of U.S. energy demand is so large that they're still only going to make up a small portion of the energy mix. And so the question becomes, how will we meet demand? Well, we have the resources. The U.S. has moved from a position of energy scarcity to abundancy. If you just look, I mean, we could be energy independent for quite a while. Flipping the page again, we have the largest resource base in the world, period. As you're looking at it, that's us in the green all the way on the left. Uh, and as I said before, uh, we are still operating in a policy of scarcity. The DC has not quite understood that with the abundancy that we have in the U.S., that we need to start building out better policies, forward looking, and thinking. An example of that is uh, permitting on federal lands. So, Onshore, in spite of onshore development, in spite of what you heard in the 2012 presidential campaigns, as well as in some of the um, State of the Unions from the President, um, development on federal lands has declined substantially since 2008. So, again, we've got the resources. Let's get some access to them. Yet another example is offshore. 85% uh, of uh, offshore is off limits to basic seismic te technology to determine what exactly the level of resources are out there. 
uh, BOEM, which is the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, just went through and did a five-year plan on what we could actually go out and try and do testing on in seismology for the next five years. They only are going to allow for one permit. Most of it is going to be in the mid-Atlantic region you see there, but even that one permit is not guaranteed. So we are leaving all of this on the table. We don't have the opportunity to get in and get involved, involved there. Uh, a little bit more on demand. In spite of these policies, things have changed dramatically. Because of American innovation and uh, development on private lands, which you all know a ton about, we're producing a million, a million and a half barrels a day. Um, this is a bigger amount than everybody combined except Russia and Saudi. So that's, we are out, we are out producing everybody but Saudi and Russia. Refineries are running at their highest points and we are sending our ethylene and ethane and everything around the country for feedstock to uh, build out everything you use from your pens to your makeup to your clothes that you're wearing. Um, so infrastructure on there, I wanted to point to the last part on the bottom is crude oil by rail growth. You'll see that is not a typo, that is actually 4,000%. Um, we really need to look at our infrastructure right now. That's pipelines, that's rail. We're looking at that in D.C. right now. That is certainly on their radar screen. I'm sure you all have seen some of that. Quickly to um, industrial gas, again, with the cheap gas here, it is significantly uh, creating a uh, manufacturing renaissance throughout the United States. Companies are coming here. You see s old school companies that are adding shifts steel folks out in Ohio, so we are really driving, in a time when the economy got sluggish, cheap oil, cheap prices for us are really driving a manufacturing renaissance. Now, IHS, which is one of your great uh, home state groups, did a study for us looking at the uh, impacts of unconventional um, oil and gas, and we went from the wellhead, midstream, and downstream, and you can see on here the significant increases in manufacturing based, but we, we will see by 2025, based on having an abundant amount of resources that are affordable for our companies to get through. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty staggering. Next one. Again, going back to, uh, at the end of the day, the, cross, the cost of producing ethylene again, which is the essential building block for every pretty much manufactured good that you have here in the United States. We're there at the, that's us. Our, th our cost is one third of Europe and Asia who are our trading partners, which again, the affordable energy makes our companies more competitive with our trade partners. All right, in addition, so to having the cheapest feedstock in the world, we also have some of the cheapest and most reliable uh, electricity in the world. This chart compares our five largest trading partners from 2001 to 2011. Uh, in the decade, we became more competitive as we got more access to our resources uh, and our trading partners uh, not so well. The only folks comparable up there, if you look, will be Canada. Japan and Germany have both run into issues and have become more expensive there on the top, up there, the U.S. kind of right there in the middle. Um, so with the cheapest feedstock and electricity, we're seeing tons of billions of dollars, or tens, not tons, tons of billions of dollars being invested in manufacturing back in the U.S. Our study estimated that between now and 2020, more than 120 billion, B, billion dollars will be invested in the United States based on the shale revolution. <coughs> All right, this is all stream, so we're gonna talk about uh, jobs at this point. So um, they accounted, we, the unconventional uh, revolution accounted for 2.1 million jobs. That's an overwhelming majority. It's about 30% of folks that got employed during the recession. This was a major gift to the government that they weren't expecting, so we got jobs out of this. But more importantly, we also got a huge amount of revenue that helped us get through the sluggish economy. Uh, so I'm, it's important up here, jobs, everybody loves a job, but you know, in DC, we happen to love our money, so we're talking about 1.6 trillion, T, trillion dollars in government revenue just from the Shell Revolution. That's huge dollars. Now, uh, now we've got our favorite topic, energy security, on this one. So if you look, as we're moving towards 2020, we are reliant on uh, imports from other countries. And those are folks that don't necessarily uh, believe in what we believe in. Their environmental standards aren't exactly the same as ours. So they are being wedged out on imports. And you are seeing uh, US production in Canada 
uh, our production moving forward, cutting out those imports. And by the way, we will still get increased uh, Canadian imports even if we don't have the Keystone Pipeline. I'm sure you all heard about the Keystone Pipeline, right? Nod yes. If you, if you haven't, then I, we're not doing a good job on telling you about it. Uh, so kind of current state of play. So we've got a bit of a glut right now. So uh, we're the victim of our own success. The market is glutted. Uh, as I said, we're globally producing about one to one and a half million more bar barrels of oil than we consume, so the price has plummeted. You guys are saying that's not bad. My gas is really cheap in my car, right? It is for mine. DC is often, often really expensive. What does that mean kind of in real life? So you've got drops in rig counts, uh, about 58 to 60 percent in the uh, DJ Basin, and, right, and it's rare to even see a rig in the Piance right now. So the real question that you all should be thinking about is, has production finally peaked? And we're going to show you that one. Well, this chart shows the drop in rig count starting back in October, all the while the production has continued to increase. But it appears with production um, declines in the Bakken and Eagleford that U.S. production may have finally peaked. And you have your EIA book uh, out on front. They're saying uh, over the next two months um, that should put some upward price pressure on crude. So fair warning. Um, so kind of back to policies of scarcity, it would be great um, because the U.S can't export right now oil, we're losing about $7.50 per well. Um, now that's not the be all end all, but an extra 15% extra if we could export would mean uh, m making the wells more profitable. It's saving thousands of jobs. And we're talking about a policy right now that's 40 years old, back in the days of you know bell bottoms and me showing up here in a pinto. So it's time to really think about 40 years ago, that policy was around for scarcity. We are now in a land of abundance, so it's time to really think about what's moving forward. Some other things that you all need to be aware of, and some of you have probably seen this here in town, a bright future for us is not given. We've got 465 fractivist kind of moratoriums, referendums, bills, um, bills in state legislatures. The first place that started um, with a moratorium on fracking and development was in Vermont. By the way, Vermont does not have the resource at all. So industry and groups were like, OK, not a big deal. It's Vermont. That's how they are. That's what they do. Uh, however, the environmentalists have started getting smarter, and they are moving on to places like your backyard here in Colorado, Denton, Texas, Louisiana. There have been bans in Maryland is going to vote on one. They've tried at local counties in Ohio. And for you all sitting in the room as local elected officials, you are the target now. The environmentalists have now taken their message from nationwide, forget statewide, they are now coming down to a county by county battle. And so that means you all need to be prepared with the information you're going to learn from some of the other speakers on what exactly energy, not just oil and gas, means to your county in revenue, in jobs, and other things. And the chamber, the chamber, uh, the U.S. Chamber worked with a lot of the local uh, state chambers and county chambers to do some basic education. The more you are comfortable talking about in the environment and the regulations, that's what Coloradans are interested in most. Then you can make the step into the benefits of the jobs and um, the revenue, because you all want to know that what's happening in your backyard or around the corner or a mile down the road is safe, and that's what most people are interested in. I'm happy to hear you're going on a rig tour. I went on four tours last year. You do not realize, if you've not been on one, the level of safety that is involved, the technology that's included. So that's one step up you're going to have to be able to explain to folks the environmental regulations are the strongest. And actually, here in Colorado, you do have some of the strongest regulations here. One little piece that I'm going to add that's not oil and gas, just as a thought for you all, is uh, ozone. No, that's not the stuff you get from the hairspray in the 70s, and no, it's not the hole in the ozone layer, but it's emissions from cars and uh, other large, uh, large manufacturing type things. So this is one of the biggest threats to Colorado and the country right now. We are at um, the EPA is proposing a new standard where it's 75 parts per billion right now, but they are per million, but they want to drop it to as low as 60. And so as you see up here, the devastating effects. I mean, this is a $140 billion loss to the country. Uh, and it's going to impact everything, because you've got to get rid of your emitters right off the bat. And so 
this is what non-attainment would look like. If your ozone level is not in attainment, you um, have problems with permitting for new industry coming to town, getting highway funds to try and build things. Here's what it would look like in Colorado. Most of your counties would be um, out of attainment, which means anybody that wants to build anything, do anything, they are gonna be severely hampered at doing that. So just kind of a quick setup for you all for the day. Um, again, demand is huge. We have the resources here, but we really need to change our, our thinking and our policies from scarcity to abundance. So thank you all very much for letting me speak this morning.